Classic WoW has a side to it that we've never seen, from scrap zones to remove dungeons, unfinished quest lines, and so much more. When Blizzard set out to make Classic originally, there was such a large volume of content built up that they wanted to put in the game, they physically did not have time to get it all done. The level cap was supposed to be 70, Northrend was seen on early versions of the map, and the Black Temple was even originally a dungeon, amongst many other things. Eventually, though, it was packaged together into whole expansions rather than just continuing on patch by patch, and that's become the way Blizzard have done major gameplay updates ever since. Vanilla was really unique in this regard because, at its outset, it was the only version of WoW which really would have made sense if it just did continue through patches instead of your standard expansion with its whole new zones, raids, quests, and so on. Currently, in the classic WoW space, a lot of people are looking for a bit of vanilla action be it a fresh, a seasonal, or something with a twist on the original experience. So I thought, why not highlight just how much of vanilla was not finished, and ask what if we never did get expansions, what content was cut or moved back, and what is the side of vanilla which we never really got to see. But first, a quick word from today's sponsor, Call of Dragons. Call of Dragons is a multiplayer fantasy strategy game available cross-platform on mobile and PC that combines elements of exploration and real-time gameplay. Call of Dragons has a huge open world with tons of fantasy races including goblins, celestial, orcs, elves, humans, and many more. Pair up different heroes together to figure out which skills work best when combined. You can even add special artifact items that further boost their power and allow allow for you to explore tons of different strategic options to win battles in the way that you prefer. You can further train up your heroes via their own talent trees to modify their skills and eventually unlock their ultimate abilities too, allowing you to match your heroes to how you would prefer to play. Each faction in the world of Tamaris have their own unique cities that set them apart from one another. Humans rely on stone and wood, elves on natural resources and magic, and orcs, tusks, and animal furs. Pick and choose your preference and create the city you want to see in the world. Call of Dragons is from the creators of Rise of Kingdoms, meaning they have first-hand experience in creating strategy games and want to offer a more in-depth experience than simply who has the greater number on their side via a whole range of strategic in-game options. And this is very much scratching the surface. Best of all, you can get that fresh game release feeling as Call of Dragons is set to come out on March 28th. You can download and pre-register right now by checking out my link below. Many thanks to Call of Dragons for the sponsor today. Let's get back to WoW. I want to start off on some loose ends that Vanilla has, things which were started and not finished until, in some cases, years later. One of the more interesting ones, and a questline which is really easy to miss following through fully, starts right at the end of Alderman. You know the deal, you beat Arcades, who is about 5 levels higher than anything else in the dungeon because classic dungeon design, the rogue in the party loots the chest before anyone has a chance to say anything, and then you go click the large discs at the back of the room and start the quest, the Platinum Discs. This has you take your discovery back to either Ironforge or Thunderbluff, which will give a follow-up reward with some potions and a nice 14 slot bag too. But that is not where this quest line ends. The bit people often miss is this unlocks a new quest which you are not directed to in any way because classic quest design called Portents of Aldum. Your faction historians have found that there may be a link between these discs you found in Alderman and a mysterious gate on the southern end of Tanaris, and they want you to take those discs there and just see what happens. Upon arrival, a pedestal sits outside of the gate. When activated, it states the player must also have the plates of Aldum before access can be granted, and since, well, you don't have them, it's back to your faction's capitals to report on this. With the quest ominously ending saying be sure to check back with us soon, Aldum beckons. In reality, it was not beckoning very hard as this is where the quest ended, and Aldum as a zone would not officially release in World of Warcraft until Cataclysm dropped some six years later. You can still see loads of comments from players who were wondering where this story would go after having finished it. Also, I was curious, so I went and had a look for the discs of Aldum in-game as a physical item, and I could not find them referenced anywhere. There's only replica discs that were added as a trash item when Aldum as a zone was revisited during 8.3 in BFA. I guess for Kata, Deathwing just kind of blew the gate off or something, 
That sounds a lore friendly enough to me. Maybe there could be a way to obtain these discs of Aldum in vanilla, like some kind of attunement, and then open Aldum as a new late game vanilla zone. Speaking of quest chains that ended rather abruptly, there is another big one that so many people will have done and very few ever ended up following through. So after battling through hordes of undead trolls, solving puzzles and reminding your group to kill every dragon mob in sight, you eventually make it to the final boss of the sunken temple, the Shade of Aranicus. It can be a bit of a tricky fight due to his level and spamming CC, but once he's down you get the Chained Essence of Aranicus, a trinket that poisons enemies in a small area around you, which is okay. It can be useful in AoE pulls and for debuffing rogues in PvP so they can't constantly re-stealth. What you also get here is a start of a quest to go and speak to Itharius, who is using the amazingly scuffed old high elf model. To proceed further, however, you have to hand in your chain essence trinket to the quest giver, which can seem like a pretty big price when half decent trinkets are just kind of well, non-existent in classic for the most part. This then has a follow-up where you have to journey across the land and sea to the faraway winter spring to talk to Umbrant the Spirit Speaker, where the quest just randomly ends. There isn't even a mysterious cliffhanger, it's just straight up not finished. In fact, the quest makes it sound like you're going to need to collect some object for the Spirit Speaker to allow him to contact and help Aranicus. I even found a comment on Wowhead quoting a blue post on this premature quest ending, saying more will be added to the Aranicus quest chain in a future patch. I can't reveal anything further at this time, but from what I've seen it's going to be really cool and fairly rewarding. Or neither of the above. I have a feeling this could have been linked into the Emerald Dream storyline, which we can talk about later, that was also not finished during Vanilla. Similar to Aldum, this could serve as a point to pick up an interesting storyline for players to explore, or at least finish a quest line and add in some kind of other reward, since you had to give in your trinket for a bit of XP and gold. One more quest related one now, or I guess more of a reputation grind. So far north in Winterspring are the creatively named Winterspring Trainers, which consist of one night elf chilling, quite literally, on top of a rock. Farming rep through repeatable quests with this one-man faction will eventually unlock the Winter Spring Frost Saber, a unique recolor of this mount so you can stand out a little bit in the crowd. However, it being a night elf, it's gonna be alliance only. But what if I told you the Horde were supposed to have their own counterpart to this quest in Vanilla 2? Because I'm pretty sure that they did, but it just never got finished. In Ungoro Crater, there are two NPCs, one to the southeast and one to the northwest, who are part of the Ravasaur Trainers. Both of these were removed at the start of TBC, but in Raf, you can head over to Morvek in the southeast and start to learn how to tame and eventually own your own Venomhide Ravasaur. These quests are really just for the completionist who wants an excuse to play the game more and chase a hard mount, but it would be a pretty easy thing to add into vanilla to mirror a piece of content which ended up being Alliance only. A much bigger part of the game then Next, and one that underwent many changes from alpha to release in vanilla, those being the NPC and character models that were used in the game. I read online now and again that some people are interested in using updated models in vanilla, but what if we went the other way instead and brought back more usage of the older alpha models? Now, to be fair, they are used now and again. In the Dead Mines, the Defias Miners are using the old human worker variants, and Defias Ambushers can spawn as part of an event just outside of Stormwind. These guys have a more thin, roguey type appearance. Certain South Sea Pirates also use old models too. There's actually plenty of examples that made it into the live game. But do you remember the old character models that there used to be? Some really didn't undergo too many changes, such as Night Elf or Taurus, Others, however, like Early Undead or the infamous female troll are, um, a little bit different from the end result. When you see some of these old models, you do start to realise why Blizzard in some cases decided that they would be better off canning them rather than trying to shoehorn them into the game somewhere. But perhaps it could be a bit more variety to character customization, add something to the appearances we are used to, or just to throw some of the questionable models back into the game as NPCs or enemies. But the area where the most content didn't make it into the game compared to how much was planned has to be zones. 
which is crazy if you think about it because vanilla is by a huge margin the largest version of WoW ever. Among the capitals of Azeroth, the one that perhaps underwent the most changes was Ironforge. Alpha Ironforge was very different to the end result that we got on launch, with far more narrow pathways throughout the city, bridges all over the place on upper levels to support houses and stores, and the central Great Forge was, well, a lot more forgy as opposed to the huge pool of lava that we have now. Comparatively, Ironforge these days is a lot more open and has more of a grand and majestic feeling to it, as opposed to a more dark and gritty dwarven city. Explorers over the years in World of Warcraft have also shown off Old Ironforge or the Hall of Thanes, an unused location underneath Ironforge that was present in game files and can still be explored to this day if you know how to click through the wall. This location was later used in the 4.1 PTR during Cataclysm as a return to this particular area to give players an official chance to see what had been lurking below for all this time. Next up, Ashara. It always felt like a zone which was lacking on content. Aside from a couple quests specific to the Horder Alliance, a location for plenty of the Sunken Temple class quests, and the incredibly inconveniently located Duke Hydraxis, there ain't all that much there, and there's quite likely some good reasons for that, because content was planned for Ashara, but it just didn't end up happening. There are two major things that we know about, both of which ended up getting scrapped. The Ashara Crater Battleground, this was going to be another PvP addition to the game with a more Dota or MOBA gameplay theme to it. Though how that would have worked in an MMO I'm not entirely sure, but if Blizzard did do it then, there would have been a very early adopter to the third person MOBA. This Battleground idea was in consideration as early as patch 1.3 and will be a repeat topic for Blizzard during Wrath, and was even brought up for Mists of Pandaria. Unfortunately, it fell to the wayside and never came to the light, and has been sitting out as a missing piece of content ever since. These days, I think having a MOBA-type battleground in an MMO, when the MOBA genre has existed for so many years now and is well-established, might be a bit of a tough sell. Another major piece of content was the Bay of Storms instance, with many screenshots online of a placeholder portal being in the vanilla beta for this. Back then, every single instance portal looked like the Dark Portal, by the way. Very little is known about what this sub-zone could have held. Was it going to be a dungeon? Was it going to be a raid? Was it going to be underwater? Would it have made Ashara more of an active zone? Probably. If I can say one thing about Ashara, though, it's maybe that Blizzard did not want it to be seen. It's a very beautiful zone when you're flying above it, but for a game with no flying mounts, the way the zone is set out can be very frustrating when you're either doing some Olympic length swim to get between quests or try not to fall off a cliff to your doom. Grim Batal is another subzone with an interesting story that could be realised in the game. As a short rundown of one of the stories that's happened there, it was once home to the Dragonmoor clan, where Alex Straza was held captive. Grim Batal served as a base of operations, where the Orcs aimed to raise a secret army to lay waste to the Alliance. However, an unlikely force led by Ronin managed to free her, where she went on to destroy the remainder of the Dragonmoor clan. Now, we don't need to copy-paste the storyline, maybe having Alex Straza are being held captive in classic sounds like a little bit much, but a mid-level dungeon involving the Dragon Moor in the wetlands? That could work. There aren't exactly a ton of dungeons around that area, and it would be very much in line with an existing enemy already found in that zone. Of course, during the Cataclysm, Grim Batal would be brought back and finally revealed as a dungeon, where thematically you ride a dragon in at the start and destroy most of the trash as you begin. Moving on though, the Hellfire Peninsula was also in development during Vanilla, though would only go on to be released during TBC. It was expected to be a later game zone, and from looking at it, it's quite reminiscent of its end result. Early versions have way more items flying in the air though, similar to how Nagrand ended up being. I think putting Hellfire in vanilla would be difficult though, it's kind of inexorably linked to the idea of going through the dark portal, and once you cross that threshold, well, surely it has to be a lot more than just one new zone, especially when that zone isn't hugely different from what ends up being playable in the expansion. Another piece of TBC content present in vanilla was the Caverns of Time, located in eastern Tanaris. Through some creative wall jumping, you can get in there, and, well, it's basically exactly what's shipped alongside TVC. Caverns of Time has always been a very intriguing place. Whenever there's a need to put something in the game which doesn't really fit with a timeline, just throw it in the Caverns of Time, say it's magic, bronze dragonflight, job done. 
from the culling of Stratholme, the battle for Mount Hyjal, to the Dragon Soul, and many more. This place has allowed for the WoW devs to tell many stories from the past all over again. Again, not really sure how much it fits into vanilla and to what extent it could be used, but if it was, well, Warcraft 3 certainly has enough story packed into it to make many instances off of. One of World of Warcraft's most famous raids ever surely would deserve a chance for a reboot in some format or another. I mean, beyond vanilla, it's both a raid in TBC and a two-part dungeon in Legion. I'm of course talking about Karazhan. From World of Warcraft's Alpha and Beta, work was already put into this location, with room after room being sculpted out, though it was definitely in need of a lot more work. There are also the crypts below which have been explorable for a very long time, but again, they were never used in the actual game until, I believe, Legion for certain artifact weapons such as the Moonkin Scythe of Alun. Karazhan is a mysterious and magical location though, more or less anything could go here in regards to it being a dungeon or a piece of raiding content. Maybe you even have it be a zone where the inside of the tower is considerably larger than it appears from the outside. You can always just say it's magic, right? As mentioned earlier, the Emerald Dream has had frequent mentions throughout the Warcraft universe. In Night Elf questing, Moonglade, Druid questing, as well as the huge physical portals that the Green Dragon world bosses guard scattered across the world. The close the closest we've gotten to an Emerald Dream in World of Warcraft was the somewhat disappointing opening raid of Legion, the Emerald Nightmare. The only legacy that left behind was it being one off, if not the easiest mythic raids of all time. It was cleared in a bit over 12 hours on its opening day. Didn't make for much of a world first race, that one. I will say after having defeated Xavius, the area afterwards was a nice look into how the dream would have been. For classic, there was technically an Emerald Dream in the game files, which as you can imagine was huge open expansive fields, alien plants and colossal trees on a seemingly endless scale, though it just never quite found its way into being a completed idea, even though it was indicated at an early stage that a lot of work had gone into it, with Jeff Kaplan being quoted as saying, the Emerald Dream is shaping up to be extremely cool. We don't want to preview any of the content yet, as it is endgame, and we want some surprises for players. The zone is massive and beautiful, and once the content team is done with it, it will be exceedingly challenging. It almost sounds as though there was a lot more done than just a level design here. Maybe what they cooked up back then was used in a future expansion in a not-so-obvious way. That tends to be the case. Speaking of content used in a future expansion, the World of Warcraft team at one point were very much considered considering player housing. Housing had been a feature of many of the successful predecessors to World of Warcraft such as Star Wars Galaxy or Ultima Online, and well, Blizzard weren't exactly out to redesign the wheel with World of Warcraft now were they? From the very outset of World of Warcraft, giving players the ability to create their own home was something under consideration. It just never took that top priority spot to really be worked on over other features for such a long time, yet remnants of it remain in the game, such as the portal behind a portcullis in Stormwind, this was to be the entrance to the residential district. Eventually, I think we can say one of two things happened to housing in World of Warcraft. Either you see Warlords of Draenor's garrison system as it, it was certainly very ambitious, but often left players feeling as though they had a little reason to leave their own instance version of the world, as everything they needed was right there. More social or communal residents could have been interpreted from the class order halls of Legion. Mages got a tower of practice and learning, warriors got a glorious skybound arena, and rogues got a murky sewer. I'm surprised they haven't tried to bring order halls back already to be honest, it could be a core expansion feature as far as I'm concerned. But we have never had housing as it's been seen in other games, as in a customizable building which enables you to choose things such as item placement, decoration, theme and so on. I really don't know how housing would fit into classic, whether it makes sense. There is kind of a nice thing about Stormwind, Ironforge, Orgrimmar and so on being busy. And if you want something to be personal to the player, does it have to be separate? Maybe it just wasn't meant to be. It really is amazing just how much content was planned for vanilla and to look back and see what was scrapped, what was unfinished and what just needed a few more expansions to come to life. I think it goes without saying I've definitely been speculating from a classic plus angle on this video too and I hope this shows how much extra stuff there possibly could be in classic whilst keeping things very true to how the game was back then. Anything else big that you think is worth a mention? Always up to look into the history of World of Warcraft once again. Let me know below. And as always, thank you all so much for watching and listening in, and I'll see you on the next one very soon.